If you're listening to this podcast, you might be a redneck. This is Funny Like a Clown Podcast. I am your host, Dennis Worth, June 7th, 2020. This is episode 64, I believe. Okay, well, well, usually I got that prepared today. I don't, but uh, let's say it's around the 60-something we're at, okay? As always, uh, Funny Like a Clown Podcast is brought to you by G Vegas Buffalo Sauce. For lightning in your mouth, get some G Vegas Buffalo Sauce for your next backyard party. And, uh, man, this stuff's homemade. Go green, go fresh, get it delivered right to your door. You can't go wrong. Available at www.gvegas.webs.com. Check it out, man. It's uh, really good stuff. Uh, we discussed comedians, man. And, uh, hey, we did a little roast uh, last episode of a local comedian. This uh, week uh, we're talking about a major stream comedian, Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, uh, man, best known for his uh, phrase, uh, you might be a redneck. And... Uh, you know, it's not often when you hit lightning in a bottle. Boy, he came out with that phrase, and it was lightning in a bottle. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of comedians. They struggle forever to get there. And some, you know, they, they hit hit something like that, and it just launches them into, into stardom. And, uh, you know, they say the best advertisement in the world, you can pay to advertise on TV. You can pay to advertise on the radio. You can pay to advertise in the paper. But the best advertisement in the world is word of mouth, okay? When people start talking about it and telling their friends about it, and that's what happened, man. Everybody was talking about you might be a redneck. They were telling their friends, and, you know, it was worth more than anything he could have ever paid for doing it. So money don't always get you there. Uh, uh, strange time in the world, man. You know, we got the Black Lives Matter things, and they're, they're tearing up the cities, and... Uh, I guess, you know, the word of mouth is overpowering the police department right now because the people are coming out and they're sick of the bullshit and they're they're sick of dirty cops. And, you know, not every cop is dirty and not every, you know, not every person's a good person either. So you got to find somewhere in the middle there. Uh, it's a tough job, man. It's a tough job to do, but that's not an excuse to kill people. So I don't know what your view is on that, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been a victim of race, of, well, not racial, but, I mean, I've been profiled before myself, uh, when I was younger, man, I, I got in a fight with a, with a guy, and the police showed up, and then, they, wow, you're a big dude, man. I got to take you to court. And like, so it's all, I never even got my side of the story. I'm like, wow, it's all my fault just because I'm big? It was, it was like, wow. So I've been profiled. I know what it's like, and it's a bunch of bullshit. And, you know, so that's all I got to say about that. Let's get back to comedy here. Uh, let's see. Uh, known for the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, and... Uh, that was a, a big hit, you know, I mean, he was already a big star, and he chose, you know, he said he was going to make his friends stars, and that's always cool when you give back. Um, his first two albums went triple platinum, which, uh, <laughs> if you just hit gold with a comedy album, that's considered huge in the business. To hit platinum with a comedy album, no, 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 that's for music albums. Comedy albums don't go platinum, yeah? Well, Jeff Foxworthy's did, man, um... He had uh, six albums on major record labels, okay? So these are like the big record labels. They're jumping on this guy he was so popular with. There's money to be made, and that's when they'll start calling you up. And, uh, you know, it's sad nowadays. You, you know, it's, it's comedy specials now. It's not comedy albums. You can't put out a comedy album because, you know, with the Internet and the free download, you're not going to make any money on it. So artists aren't even doing it. Now it's comedy specials. Which they gotta put out for free because they can't even make fun money again doing them. So I guess he could put an album. He just can't make any money off it. But they said they're more promotional tools. They make up where they were, you know, before you could go see a concert for say twenty bucks. Well, now you're paying forty bucks because they gotta make up for the twenty bucks for the free concert. Then you're not paying for their album. So that's why you're paying so much for live shows. They gotta make up for the money to lose on the albums. But uh, it's comedy specials now. They're giving them for free, but you know the free ones. It's an advertisement tool. They get you out to the concert, and that's where they make up for the money to lose it on the albums by doubling the ticket prices that you see to see them live. But if you like comedy, hey, man, you're willing to pay it. That's that's what you got to do. That's the new day and age. Um, let's see. He put out several books on redneck jokes. He put out an autobiography that was a big hit called uh, No Shirt, No Shoes, No Problem. Okay, and that was that's basically a guy with the rednecks thing where he worked there, but... Uh, you know, that, that's what they do. I remember Jeff Ross said, you know, uh, he became famous for doing the Comedy Central roast, you know, where a lot of comedians, they become famous for doing that. That's when you start out, they let you on the roast, then you become too big of a comedian for doing it. But he was so good at roasting that he became the guy. He's a specialty at roasting, and he just stayed with that even after he stopped doing the roasts. 
He's known as the Big Roach Guy. So when you become a specialist at what you do, that's what you're known for. That's what you come for. I mean, there's a local comedian around here. I work with Jerry Caruso. He does a lot of Italian jokes, you know. Well, if you got an Italian party, who are you calling? You're calling Jerry because he's a specialist at what he does in Italian jokes. So uh, let's see. Uh, the 1990s, uh, he tried out the Jeff Foxworthy television show, had his own show, and, uh, when you get your own show named after you, you know, a lot of people, sometimes you get in a show, sometimes you star, but when they name the actual show after you, that shows just how you, be, how big you've become in the business right there, that your name associated with anything. It's like Michael Jordan, he can stamp his name on anything, they're gonna buy sneakers, perfume, I mean, anything he stamps his name on, they're buying the Michael Jordan brand name, and that's what Jeff Foxworthy got to, his name was a brand name name and that's uh that's the top of your game right there um the Bukha comedy tour i eventually turned into the Bukha tv specials and uh he moved on from that and did are you smarter than a fifth grader from 2007 to 2009 and then it ran 2009 to 2011 the syndication and uh when you're in syndication you're still getting checks for work you previously did so that's always a good thing when you can do that uh, he has a national radio broadcast show, the Jeff Foxworthy Count. Let's try that again. The Jeff Foxworthy Countdown from 1999 to 2009. Uh, he did three seasons on the Game Show Network, uh, doing the American Bible Challenge. Is a new thing he's working on now. So uh, here's a guy, man. Biggest thing in the world. Uh, you know, stayed relevant. Came back. Had a second run being the biggest thing with the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. And he's still staying relevant now, man. The guy, you just never go away. Most people have the little run in comedy and then that's it. Well, if you stick around, you go down as one of the legends. And I guess he'll go down as one of the legends because he stuck around while others disappeared, man. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, born in Atlanta, Georgia. Which, uh, Atlanta's like a mecca for stand-up comedy. I've never been there, but I've heard from people, like, if you go to Atlanta, Georgia, like, literally every street corner there's a comedy club. That's how big comedy is in Atlanta. Like, on every street corner there's a comedy club. And you, you couldn't do that in every city, you know? There's not enough people, you know, you can only have a few that put the others out of business. But Atlanta, so many people are seeing comedy. The demand is so big. I remember they did that with the Starbucks coffee shops in L.A. They said, you know, they wouldn't be stupid enough to put a Starbucks and build another one right across the street, would they? Yes, they would. You know why? Because everybody's buying their coffee, so... That's how big comedy is down there. Uh, he worked at a computer company that his dad worked at. So his dad got him a job there, which he went to school for. Um, and I guess he was the office clown. So at the urging of co-workers, uh, he entered the Great Southeastern Launch Off, which uh, was a comedy competition down there at Punchline's Comedy Club in 1984. And now, if you're the office clown, okay, you might want to try comedy. And you might go out and do it. But who would ever think you'd enter a comedy contest, one of the biggest ones and one of the biggest meccas for comedy, and win the damn thing? Well, he went out and won the damn thing. He didn't just enter it, he won it, which shows how good I guess he was at being the office clown. Um, 1993, his album might be a redneck if. Uh, started a fad, as we said, with the whole redneck statement. Everybody was saying it, and they were coming up with their own things. Hey, it might be a redneck if, and everybody was trying to come up with their own idea. So word of mouth. Sold over 3 million copies. Can you imagine that? 3 million copies of an album. What, we paid 10 bucks for an album back then? So even if he got 5 bucks, half of that from every album, what's he got? I mean, 1.5 million just from albums? I mean, that ain't even including all his concert sales and everything else. I mean, ridiculous to think the amount of money these guys make when they hit it like that. Um, 1995 came out with another album, Games Rednecks Play which received a Grammy a nomination for Best Spoken Comedy Album. Uh, totally Committed Album, 1988, and was coincided with the new thing they did, as we talked about, a one-hour HBO comedy special, which albums, I guess, a thing of the past, and comedy specials are the new things that they do. Um, 1999 and 2001, he was again nominated for a Grammy Award, and kind of sad he never won one. I mean, it's cool just to be nominated. That shows you're getting recognized. The Grammys are the biggest of the biggest awards, but... Would have been nice just to get one. And uh, I believe they said he had the biggest selling comedy album of all time, okay? And if you consider how many comedians put out uh, albums, you know, who, who's who's the best selling comedy album of all time? It's got to be Pryor. It's got to be Carlin. No, it's Jeff Foxworthy, which I think that Adam Sandler might have beat him recently. But, I mean, for forever, he, if not still, I'm not sure that he did. But, I mean... To just, just to say you've had the best-selling album of all time, that's something. He appealed to both audiences, you know? Some people like dirty comedy, some people work clean comedy. Everybody's got a different like. 
But this guy, he appealed to everybody. When you can appeal to everybody, you're going to sell a hell of a lot more comments than, but you know, uh, who was it? Doug Stanhope said he worked really hard. He know he does dirty comedy. It's what he likes to do. He's got a small cult following, and he's happy with that, you know? I mean, some people are happier doing what they love to do. If you love doing dirty comedy, you know, I mean, you're doing what you love to do. You may not be making the big bucks. Money ain't everything in life, you know? I mean, if he enjoyed doing clean comedy, made the money good for him, but... You know, there's nothing wrong with telling a dirty joke every now and then. That's what you enjoy to do. Even if you're not making the big bucks, hey, you know, you're living the life you want to live, you know. Life's too short to, to do something other people want you to do just because you can make money at it, you know. Um, we've discussed that before. You get booked a lot more if you're clean. But, you know, if you're doing something you don't love to do, who cares if you're getting booked, right? Uh, all right, back to, back to Jeff Foxworthy here. Uh, let's see, um, 1995, as we mentioned, the Jeff Foxworthy television show named after him aired on ABC. Wasn't a big hit. It was canceled after the first season. Uh, NBC picked it up after that. They canceled, canceled again after one season. And uh, they cited they thought it was, like, too Southern for a national audience, which, you know, not everybody, you know, everybody can laugh at the Southern thing, but not everybody wants to make it a part of their life. I mean... TV is a lot different than stand-up comedy, and there's been many artists who are big, big, big in the stand-up world, and they couldn't do it in, in the TV world, and I guess he was one of them that just didn't cross over. I remember uh, Andrew Dice Clay, he did a TV series where they made him clean up his act, and everybody tuned in wanting to see the Dice Man, and he wasn't the Dice Man anymore. He was like this clean family guy, and he alienated the audience that he had, you know? So, I mean... If you're doing the Southern thing, the Southern guys loved you, they accepted you, but it wasn't, it was too Southern for a national audience, I guess was what it was. Um, let's see, I remember this one, okay, and I don't know why I was clicking by, and the only reason, you know, you click that, your channel surfing on your TV, the only reason I stopped was because I like comedy and I saw it was Jeff Foxworthy, but he hosted the uh, Country Awards in 1989, uh, not 89, 1998, 1999, and 2000. And I remember the thing that cracked me up when you won, you got this, like, huge oversized belt buckle because it was country. They didn't have trophies. You got, like, this huge belt buckle was uh, was the award. I was like, well, it must be cool to say you won one and, like, wear it around. Like, what are you doing with that ridiculous belt buckle? Well, I won that. It's a trophy. So I always thought it was cool to be able to, to wear a trophy, I guess, would have been cool. You know, you can wear it around and say you're not bragging about it. You're just wearing it because it's an article of clothing, I guess. But, uh... I guess, uh, yeah, he worked clean, and you know, country music, that's known for the clean artists, you know, if you want to do the dirty thing, that's rock and roll, so I mean, which way do you want to roll? Uh, I remember Sam Keniston, he was big, he was like, he chose MTV, you know, he didn't do the comedy things, MTV was the big thing coming, he was the rock and roll comic, and he played the rock and roll comic in the millions of dollars, so good for him. Um, <laughs> here's one I found there, he was actually a guest in 1980. 98 on Space Coast, Space Ghost Coast to Coast talk show, which it, it cracks me up that they choose. I mean, I remember Space Ghost from when I was a kid, and, and while you did watch it, it wasn't one of the major cartoons at the time. But who the hell came up with 10, 20 years later? You know what? We got to go back and we got to make Space Ghost a talk show now, man. We got to bring that back. We're gonna make a talk show. Who could? Let's do Space Ghost. Who came up with this idea? And it blows my mind even more that after they followed through with the idea that it became a hit. I guess <laughs> it actually worked. People were tuning in and they got big guests like Jeff Foxworthy who, who were going to be on Space Ghost Coast to Coast talk show. It was like, I remember they did ALF, okay? And ALF was a television series and the first season was big. And after that, they dragged it out for a couple seasons. But it was never a, like a huge hit show. They canceled it. But Alf stayed around forever, and it was like 20 years later, they brought back Alf at a talk show, and I'm like, why would they do that? Who can, who's going to tune in to watch Alf? I mean, the TV show wasn't a hit. Why would they bring back, you know, a show that, a character from a show that wasn't a hit and, like, reboot it? And it didn't. It failed miserably as talk show, but uh, people were tuning in. Space Ghost Coast to Coast talk show. We've talked about it before, and I guess it's making a, I guess you get a cult following. It's never a big mainstream thing, but when you get a strong cult following where maybe the industry won't support you, but the fans will, it's a great thing to have, you know, and it's like we talked about that. You don't have to let the industry control you with, you know, YouTube and all the podcast networks. You can become an internet star and become just as big as the mainstream stars, and Joe Rogan's proven that with his podcast. I mean, he's in ridiculous numbers on the internet, bigger than probably numbers he could hit on television, you know, and 
TV's not getting their cut. He's, he's got the whole thing going on, and I'm sure they're not liking that very much. But uh, after that, he came out with the TV show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And I'll tell you right now, I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. That uh, was on Fox TV during prime time. Which, if you get in prime time, that, that's when the most people are watching TV. You work all day, you come home, you watch TV. You know, if you get on during the daytime, people are at work, there's not as many people. You get on during the nighttime, people are sleeping, there's not as many people. But that little before you go to bed after work, that's prime time. And the reason they call it because so many more people are tuned in. And I did a local television show myself, The Comedy Kitchen it was called, where I cooked up a dish with uh, some local comedians, some major stars, and I brought them on. And they told me the same thing. They said, you know, if you work clean, we'll put you on during prime time. But if you get dirty on the show, we'll still air it. But you're going to be on late night. It's going to be such a smaller audience. And uh, I guess, you know, where it was a cooking show, you know, I, I remember the Food Network. They said, you know, people tune in the Food Network because they're looking for a break from, you know, the, the regular. They want something, you know, they can take a break from the dirty comedy. Where they love dirty comedy, every now and then you want a break from it. You too, that's why they turn in the two the Food Network, because they're not looking for that kind of thing, you know, they're looking for something simple. So I did, I kept it simple, and I kept it, you know, uh, you know, where they could air it during prime time. I did, I still get recognized, just last week I got recognized by a Spanish guy, he was in a restaurant I work at talking Spanish to me, tough getting his order placed, I finally got a place, and he's looking at me, looking at me, at the end of the order he goes, hey, you comedy kitchen man, <laughs> he recognized me. Which I did have a big Spanish following. It was one of the few TV networks, I guess they had the subtitles they could read in the language. So all the Spanish people watched it because they could get it in the language. So it's still fun to be recognized. I'm a big, I call myself a Walmart hit. I've been on a Walmart recognized. And you recognize at Walmart, you ain't hitting the top of your game, but it's still fun. I'm having, I'm having fun with the local comedy thing. And uh, hey, you guys listening to the Funny Outcome Podcast, maybe you'll launch me in a national stardom and I became my internet head. Thank you guys for listening, man. Tell your friends, tune us in because... You know, uh, if you're a comedian, it's a cool thing, and everybody loves comedy, but know your past. If you don't know your past, you're doomed to repeat it. So, you know, going over what all these great comedy comedians are doing, man, it's great to relive your childhood, and it's great, you know, if you educate, learn from the mistakes they made, learn from the success they have, learn, educate yourself. That's what we're doing on Funny Like Clown Podcast. We're educating ourselves on the subject of comedy. And I remember, man, I got a son, and I remember when he was in fifth grade, he'd ask me, Dad, can you help me with homework? Sure, I'd love to help you with homework. And I'd look at this stuff, and I'm like, man, this ain't nothing like when I went to school in fifth grade. Man, I don't know what the hell these guys are talking about myself. I, I ain't smarter than fifth grader, I guess, because when I went to fifth grade, it's totally different than what they're doing in fifth grade now at times. So uh, <laughs> I don't even think I learned in high school to teach the stuff they were teaching him in the fifth grade. So times are changing, man. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess that's why we got the computer. You can Google stuff now or... We had encyclopedias. We had books back then. We had to open up and search for information on stuff. We didn't have it at our fingertips, you know. You had the door-to-door -door salesman. They'd come. They'd sell you a big set of encyclopedias, and all your information was there, and you had to look up by the letter and read it all, and it's so much easier nowadays. That's what technology does, but you lose a little bit from it, too. Technology makes life too easy sometimes, you know. Let's see. Uh, 2005. He was the uh, subject of a Comedy Central roast, which um, if they're roasting you on Comedy Central, that, that means you're one of the legends of the game, you know, because they only have the biggest names on there. And they actually said, uh, you know, you know, they had Roseanne Barr on there, who's just a legend for female comics, and uh, they said it didn't do too good. They, the kids of today, they don't want to, you know, learn about the legends of comedy, which is sad for my podcast. They, they want the edgy person. They want the fuck up. They want the person who's doing, like, crazy stuff. Because they want to say, oh, he's crazy. What's he going to do on the roast? It's, that's what they, the Justin Biebers, you know, the Charlie Sheens. Like, people are messing up in life. That's what people tune in to see, I guess. I don't know why. I remember Mike Tyson when he was fighting. The ticket sales weren't going very good. And he went on TV and he started telling the, you know, on live TVs to F this, F that. And they cut him off, but... They thought, oh, Mike's going crazy again. We better tune in the fight. And it upped the sales. That's what they do. That's how they sell things right there, by by gaining your interest by doing crazy things. Is he going to snap again? I got to I gotta, gonna bite, bite somebody's ear off again? I got to tune in and find out. So that's the game they play. They hype it up, and they know what they're doing, man. Okay? Well, while they're gearing you up with this stuff, they're laughing all the way to the bank. It's all about money for some people, you know? Uh, let's see. 2011... He was a guest on ABC's Shark Tank, which was a 
uh, uh, Bob, yeah, it was a celebrity guest show on that time. He was a celebrity guest. Uh, 2012, he starred in the Game Show Network's Bible Challenge. Um, it was uh, in 2013, the American Banking Competition. He was on another TV show. So, you know, even after his big runs, he's still got stuff going on where he's still on TV. You know, I mean, sure, it ain't ABC, it ain't NBC, but the Game Show Network, they're making stars. I saw what? The History Channel had Larry the Cable Guy doing something. And they're offering big bucks to get these stars over there. Like I said, they're the brand name. You want people to come over to your TV channel? Well, you got to get the brand name over there. So they're, they're paying these guys big bucks to get people over to their channel. And it's a smart move because once you get them over there, then the money starts rolling in from sponsors because that's who people want to see. Uh, he did the Outdoor Challenge and uh, Versus, which was also some shows... You know, not mainstream shows, but he's staying as a uh, celebrity guest on shows. Uh, 2019, he was uh, a judge on Bring the Funny. And I, I, I mean, I didn't see that, but I assume if he was a judge, it was some kind of comedy competition where he was one of the judges on. Which I always thought uh, Last Comic Standing, they brought Roseanne Barr on. I thought that was a really good move. Because if, if you're going to have somebody judging you, you want it to be one of the legends of the game. Because they've already done it, you know. When you got these people judging you, don't know their ass from their elbows, or who are you to judge me? Which I've had happen, okay? I'm not no big comedian, but I mean, in central Massachusetts, I'm one of the biggest bookers of comedy out here. And I guess some kid who's hitting an open mic, and he's like on Facebook preaching to me, man, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should. Well, what are you doing? I'm hitting open mics. Well, if you're hitting open mics, who the hell are you to tell me who's been successful in comedy what to do? You're nobody, but they want to think they know everything, you know? Uh, let's see, uh, the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. Which he did uh, with comedians Bill Ingvall, Larry the Cable Guy, and Ron White. And, um, you know, he actually said, he's like, you know, these were guys he did before he was a star. And even after he was a star, he had these guys open for him. And he said, you know what? i got to make you guys stars. That's the next thing I'm going to do for comedy. Which Rodney did it too. Rodney Dangerfield, I credit him for being one of the greatest comedians ever. But, man, he brought us the next generation of comedians. And it's a responsibility because when you start comedy, someone has to give you a break. And then when you hit the next level, it's up to you to pay forward and give somebody else a break. And it's cool that Jeff Foxworthy did this. He said he was going to make these guys stars. He brought them on the Blue Collar Comedy Tour, and he did it. He made these guys, I mean, they went from nobodies to somebodies like that because of uh, the backing of Jeff Foxworthy. And uh, Larry the Cable Guy once had a joke. I said, uh... They were all on the Blue Collar Comedy Tour coming up with redneck jokes, and Larry came up with, when your opening act goes on to make more money than you, you might be a redneck. I cracked up when he said that. Here's Jeff's the one who gave him a break, and Larry went on to be bigger, bigger than, well, make more money. I'm not going to say bigger, but he went on to make more money than, uh, than Jeff did. But hats off for him to give him back. It's a responsibility, okay? If somebody gives you a break or something, when you become a master of the game, it's up to you to give back. And I hate the comics who forget where they come from and they don't give back. And that, that drives me nuts. I've interacted with some great ones and I've interacted with some real jerks. Man, I forget where they come from. And, uh, you know, it's easy, too. And sometimes, you know, when you're a fan, you, you expect, you know, your heroes to act one way. But it's like, you know, you, be, you can become over-aggressive, too. You know what I'm saying? So if you're a fan, it's cool being a fan. I'm sure they appreciate it. But when you're over-aggressive about it, you know, then they get a little turned off. I recently dealt with that where, you know, there was a pretty big name in comedy. And I became friendly with him, you know, and I was just like, well, well, you know, when you do comedy for a hobby is one thing. But when you get to the next level, it's a job, okay? You get paid to what you do. And, you know, and I'm saying, hey, come on, let's do this just for fun. Let's do this just for fun. Well, he's past the point of doing it just for fun. He wanted to get paid. And, you know, me being a fan, it was fun for me, where he's the star. It wasn't fun for him. He got offended. I was over-aggressive about it. So you got to be careful there, too. It's good to be a fan, but don't be an over-aggressive fan, okay? Um, let's see. Uh... He uh, toured the country for record crowds doing the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. They were breaking record crowds for this, for comedy shows, uh, where, you know, Eddie Murphy started that, where they went from playing comedy clubs to halls to arenas, you know. You're a comedian playing arenas. You know, Sam Kinison did that. Dice Clay did that. Eddie Murphy did that. Few comedians can thought an arena, you know. That's just, that's the next level right there. Uh, they were just constantly extending the tour because there was such a demand for it. I think originally they were going to do 10 shows, and it's like there was such a demand by people, they just kept adding them, which, uh, 
I saw recently, what was it, Motley Crue, Def Leppard, Poison, and Joan Jett are touring. They're coming to Boston, and within two days they added a second show because there was such a demand they knew they could sell out two shows. So, you know, when the people demand it, that's why the Eagles got back together. The Eagles couldn't stand each other, but the money was there, man. The fans demanded, it's like, the, the fans were willing to offer them more money than they could turn down to get back together. And, man, you throw that much money, and a whole lot of hate gets disappeared. You start making up because there's money to be made. Um... As we said, the Blue Collar Comedy Tour turned into Blue Collar TV, um, which was successful for a while. Um, he actually put out a, you know, a bunch of comedy books, and um, he actually put out a cookbook on comedy called The Redneck Grill, which was a genius move, because uh, cookbooks are big sellers. So many people are into cooking. That's why I did the Comedy Kitchen, because I know there's a big market. People like to eat. I'm a big guy. Trust me, I know I like to eat. But uh, the Redneck Grill, man, cookbook, and that must have sold big-time money. So, uh, like I said, boom, you put the Jeff Foxworthy stamp on it. No matter what you're putting out, they're going to buy it, because his name's a, a brand name. Um, here's one I did know about him, which was interesting. He put out a line of children books, uh, Dirt on My Shirt and uh, Silly Street. And uh, those are big sellers, too, which... I always thought that was cool. George Carlin did that. He was the voice of Thomas the Tank Engine. Where, who, who wouldn't have? You know, we all grew up watching Sesame Street. Who wouldn't want to be a guest on Sesame Street? I've always thought of doing that. Toward the end of my career, I'd love to do a children's TV show and uh, just be a part of that. Be, be, you know, be, be like the next Mister Rogers or something. You know, just to entertain kids and the next generation. You know, if they remember you from their childhood, that always. I thought that's one of the coolest things. You know, that you could possibly do to remember by the next generation. Not just for your comedy, but, you know, being an icon for children's television. Always something I wanted to try to tap onto toward the end of my career. Um, he did uh, another book, uh, How to Really Stink at Golf, which uh, <laughs> I can relate to that. I took up golf for one season, and I said, you know what? I took up golf, you know, as a sport to have fun when I left work, and I was getting more stressed out playing golf than I was at work, and I'm like, you know, I ain't doing something for fun and getting more stressed out than I am at work. That's, if you can golf, God bless you. I couldn't pick up the game for the life of me. I did it one season, and I quit. I said, I don't need to be aggravated by golf, and it wasn't for me, so thank goodness because I'm doing comedy, and I'm enjoying the heck out of that. Um, he was brought up in a uh, very religious family, you know, down there southern. I know they got the, what, they call it the Bible Belt there because it's a church on, like, every so many feet and, like, one strip down south. They're really into religion down there. Good for them. And he actually said that, you know, all the money that he made, it wasn't his money. It was God's money because, you know, God granted him that, you know, by giving him, you know, choosing him. So uh, he chooses, chooses to give back. And I always said, man, it's cool to give back when you hit that level. Don't forget where you came from. Uh... He actually started a Bible study. Now, here's one of the biggest comics in the world. You know, time is money. I mean, this guy could be doing all kinds of stuff to, to make money. But he chose, he did a Bible study with the homeless. And he said it started out with 15 people locally in his neighborhood. And it turned out to where over 100, 100 homeless people now come out to do a Bible study with him. And I mean, if that ain't a good way to give back, I don't know what the heck is right there. That's not forgetting where you came from. And uh, I remember, I guess he said that... Uh, his mother, you know, he went to church, and the church wanted him to accept Jesus as a Savior. And his mother said, you know, you're not really old enough now. I want you to wait until you're older where you fully understand religion, you know, before you accept Jesus as your Savior. And he said he went to church anyway. It was his choice with his mom, and uh, good for him. Where I tried to expose my son to religion, and his mother wasn't religious. She was a negative force in it, and, man, he ended up hating me for it. I'm like, well, you know... You would have never even known about it. Somebody had to expose you to it. I mean, if you get older and you don't want to follow it, that's your choice. But it's kind of a responsibility, I think, of a parent to expose you. But uh, that's that's why the child support superhero came around. Because, you know, children need both parents on the same page, not on a different page. And, uh, you know, hopefully we're all on the same page in comedy. We're learning interesting things, you know. We just learned some interesting things about Jeff Foxworthy together. And that's a cool thing. Um... I recently joined a podcast group, and they asked me, they said, you know, think this one out well. Why do you do a podcast? Give me three reasons. And I thought about it. I'm like, well, I'm having fun. That's the first thing, you know. I mean, as long as I'm having fun, I'm, I'm so thankful you guys are tuning in. But I'm having fun just doing it myself. If I only watch it, I'm having fun. Uh, second reason, I said to be informative, you know. I mean, if you do something, I never was one to do things half ass. If you're going to do it, do it right. Just like Jeff Foxworthy, you know? If he did it, you put everything you got into it. You don't do anything half-assed. You don't do it halfway. 
And I said to grow. So hopefully I'm growing, you're growing. And if you tell your friends to tune in my podcast, they can grow with us. This is Funny Like Clown Podcast. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, Keep laughing, folks, because as always, I'm going to tell you, laughter is the best medicine. Until next week, keep them laughing.